hyperlink backslash l chapter 2. Elide Locken had once hoped to travel far and wide, to a place where no one had ever heard of Adarlan or Turason, so distant that Vernon didn't stand a chance of finding her. She hadn't anticipated that it might actually happen. Standing in the dusty, ancient alley of an equally dusty, ancient city in a kingdom south of Doranel, Elide marveled at the noontime bells ringing across the clear sky, the sun baking the pale stones of the buildings, the dry wind sweeping through the narrow streets between them. She'd learned the name of this city thrice now, and still couldn't pronounce it. She supposed it didn't matter. They wouldn't be here long. Just as they had not lingered in any of the cities they'd swept through, or the forests or mountains or lowlands. Kingdom after kingdom, the relentless pace set by a prince who seemed barely able to remember to speak, let alone feed himself. Elide grimaced at the weathered witch. Leathers she still wore, her fraying grey cloak and scuffed boots, then glanced at her two companions in the alley. Indeed, they'd all seen better days. Any minute now, Gavriel murmured, a tawny eye on the alley's entrance. A towering, dark figure blended into the scant shadows at the half-crumbling archway, monitoring the bustling street beyond. Elide didn't look too long toward that figure. She'd been unable to stomach it these endless weeks. Unable to stomach him, or the unbearable ache in her chest. Elide frowned at Gavriel. We should have stopped for lunch. He jerked his chin to the worn bag sagging against the wall. There's an apple in my pack. Glancing toward the building rising above them, Elide sighed and reached for the pack, riffling through the spare clothes, rope, weapons, and various supplies until she yanked out the fat red and green apple. The last of the many they'd plucked from an orchard in a neighboring kingdom. Elide wordlessly extended it to the Fey Lord. Gavriel arched a golden brow. Elide mirrored the gesture. I can hear your stomach grumbling. Gavriel huffed a laugh and took the apple with an incline of his head before cleaning it on the sleeve of his pale jacket. Indeed it is. Down the alley, Elide could have sworn the dark figure stiffened. She paid him no heed. Gavriel bit into the apple, his canines flashing. Edie and Oshriver's father the resemblance was uncanny, though the similarities stopped at appearance. In the brief few days she'd spent with Edian, he'd proved himself the opposite of the soft-spoken, thoughtful male. She'd worried, after Asterin and Vesta had left them aboard the ship they'd sailed here, that she might have made a mistake in choosing to travel with three immortal males. That she'd be trampled underfoot. But Gavriel had been kind from the start, making sure Elide ate enough and had blankets on frigid nights, teaching her to ride. The horses they'd spent precious coin to purchase because Elide wouldn't stand a chance of keeping up with them on foot, ankle, or no. And for the times when they had to lead their horses over rough terrain, Gavriel had even braced her leg with his magic, his power a warm summer breeze against her skin. She certainly wasn't allowing Lorcan to do. So for her. She would never forget the sight of him crawling after Maeve once the queen had severed the blood oath. Crawling after Maeve like a shunned lover, like a broken dog desperate for its master. Elin had been brutalized, their very location betrayed by Lorcan to Maeve, and still he tried to follow. Right through the sand still wet with Elin's blood. Gavriel ate half the apple and offered Elide. The rest. You should eat, too. She frowned at the bruised purple beneath Gavriel's eyes. Beneath her own, she had no doubt. Her cycle, at least, had come last month, despite the hard travel that burned up any reserves of food in her stomach. That had been particularly mortifying. To explain to three warriors who could already smell the blood that she needed supplies. More frequent stops. She hadn't mentioned the cramping that twisted her gut, her back, and lashed down her thighs. She'd kept riding, kept her head down. She knew they would have stopped. Even Rowan would have stopped to let her rest. But every time they paused, Elide saw that iron box. Saw the whip, shining with blood, as it cracked through the air. Heard Elin screaming. She'd gone so Elide wouldn't be taken. Had not hesitated to offer herself in Elide's. 
stead. The thought alone kept Elida stride her mare. Those few days had been made slightly easier by the clean strips of linen that Gavriel and Rowan provided, undoubtedly from their own shirts. When they'd cut them up, she had no idea. Elide bit into the apple, savoring the sweet. Tart crispness. Rowan had left some coppers from a rapidly dwindling supply on a stump to account for the fruit they'd taken. Soon they'd have to steal their suppers. Or sell their horses. A thumping sounded from behind the sealed windows a level above, punctuated with muffled male shouting. Do you think we'll have better luck this time? Elide quietly asked. Gavriel studied the blue painted shutters, carved in an intricate latticework. I have to. Hope so. Luck had indeed run thin these days. They'd had little since that blasted beach in Ilwi, when Rowan had felt a tug in the bond between him and Elin the mating bond and had followed its call across the ocean. Yet when they'd reached these shores after several dreadful weeks on storm wild waters, there had been nothing left to track. No sign of Maeve's remaining armada. No. Whisper of the Queen's ship, the Nightingale, docking in any port. No news of her returning to her seat in Doranel. Rumors were all they'd had to go on, hauling them across mountains piled deep with snow, through dense forests and dried out plains. Until the previous kingdom, the previous city, the packed streets full of revelers out to celebrate some Huan, to honor the gods when. The veil between worlds was thinnest. They had no idea those gods were nothing but beings from another world. That any help the gods offered, any help Elide had ever received from that small voice at her shoulder, had been with one goal in mind, to return home. Pons that's all Elide and Elin and the others were to them. It was confirmed by the fact that Elide had not heard a whisper of Anitha's guidance since that horrible day in Ilwi. Only nudges during the long days, as if they were reminders of her presence. That someone was watching. That, should they succeed in their quest to find Elin, the young queen would still be expected to pay the ultimate price to those gods. If Dorian Havilliard and Manon Blackbeak were able to recover the third and final word king. If the young king didn't offer himself up as the sacrifice in Elin's stead. So Elide endured those occasional nudges, refusing to contemplate what manner of creature had taken such an interest in her. In all of them. Elide had discarded those thoughts as they coomed through the streets, listening for any whisper of Maeve's location. The sun had set, Rowan snarling with each passing hour that yielded nothing. As all other cities had yielded nothing. Elide had made them keep strolling the merry streets, unnoticed and unmarked. She'd reminded Rowan each time he flashed his teeth that there were eyes in every kingdom, every land. And if word got out that a group of Fey warriors was terrorizing cities in their search for Maeve, surely it would get back to the Fey Queen in no time. Night had fallen, and in the rolling golden hills beyond the city walls, bonfires had kindled. Rowan had finally stopped growling at the sight. As if they had tugged on some thread of memory, of pain. But then they'd passed by a group of Fey soldiers out drinking and Rowan had gone still. Had sized the warriors up in that cold, calculating way that told Elide he'd crafted some plan. When they ducked into an alley, the Fey prince had laid it out in stark, brutal terms. A week later, and here they were. The shouting grew in the building above. Elide grimaced as the cracking wood overpowered the ringing city bells. Should we help? Gavriel ran a tattooed hand through his golden hair. The names of warriors who had fallen under his command, he'd explained. When she'd finally dared ask last week. He's almost done. Indeed, even Lorcan now scowled with impatience at the window above Elide and Gavriel. As the noon bells finished peeling, the shutters burst open. Shattered was a better word for it as two females came flying through them. One of them, brown-haired and bloodied, shrieked while he fell. Prince Rowan Whitethorn said nothing while he fell with him. While he held his grip on the male, teeth bared. Elide stepped aside, giving them ample space while they crashed into the pile of crates in the alley, splinters and debris soaring. 
she knew a gust of wind kept the fall from being fatal for the broad-shouldered male. Whom Rowan hauled from the wreckage by the collar of his blue tunic. He was of no use to them dead. Gavriel drew a knife, remaining by Elide's side as Rowan slammed the stranger against the alley wall. There was nothing kind in the prince's face. Nothing warm. Only cold-blooded predator. Hell bent on finding the queen who held his heart. Please, the male sputtered. In the common tongue. Rowan had found him, then. They couldn't hope to track Maeve, Rowan had realized on some Huan. Yet finding the commanders who served Maeve, spread across various kingdoms on loan to mortal rulers that, they could do. And the male Rowan snarled at, his own lip. Bleeding, was a commander. A warrior, from the breadth of his shoulders to his muscled. Thus. Rowan still dwarfed him. Gavriel and Lorcan, too. As if, even amongst the Fae, the three of them were a wholly different breed. Here's how this goes, Rowan said to the sniveling commander, his voice deadly soft. A brutal smile graced the prince's mouth, setting the blood from his split lip running. First I break your legs, maybe a portion of your spine so you can't crawl. He pointed a bloodied finger down the alley. To Lorcan. You know who that is, don't you? As if in answer, Lorcan prowled from the archway. The commander began trembling. The leg and spine, your body would eventually heal, Rowan went on as Lorcan continued his stalking approach. But what Lorcan Salvatero will do to you, a low, joyless laugh. You won't recover from that, friend. The commander cast frantic eyes toward Elide, toward Gavriel. The first time this had happened two days ago Elide hadn't been able to watch. That particular commander hadn't possessed any information worth sharing, and given the unspeakable sort of brothel they'd found him in, Elide hadn't really regretted that Rowan had left his body at one end of the alley. His head at the other. But today, this time. Watch. See, a small. Voice hissed in her ear. Listen. Despite the heat and sun, Elide shuddered. Clenched her teeth bottling up all the words that swelled within her. Find someone else. Find a way to use your own powers to forge the lock. Find a way to accept your fates to be trapped in this world, so we needn't pay a debt that wasn't ours to begin with. Yet if Aneath now spoke when she had. Only nudged her these months. Elide. Swallowed those raging words. As all mortals were expected to. For Ilan she could submit. As Elin would ultimately submit. Gavriel's face held no mercy, only a grim sort of practicality as he beheld the shaking commander dangling from Rowan's iron grip. Tell him what he wants to know. You'll only make it worse for yourself. Lorcan had nearly reached them, a dark wind swirling about his long fingers. There was nothing of the male she'd come to know on his harsh face. At least, the male he'd been before that beach. No, this was the mask she'd first seen in Oakwald. Unfeeling. Arrogant. Cruel. The commander beheld the power gathering in Lorcan's hand, but managed to sneer at Rowan, blood coating his teeth. She'll kill all of you. A black eye already bloomed, the lid swollen shut. Air pulsed at. Elide's ears as Rowan locked a shield of wind around him. Sealing in all sound. Maeve will kill every last one of you traitors. She can try, was Rowan's mild reply. See, Aneath whispered again. When the commander began screaming this time, Eli did not look away. And as Rowan and Lorcan did what they'd been trained to do, she couldn't decide if Anitha's order had been to help or a reminder of precisely what the gods might do should they disobey. Hyperlink backslash L chapter 3 the stag horns were burning, and oak walled with them. The mighty, ancient trees were little more than charred husks, ash thick as snow raining down. Embers drifted on the wind, a mockery of how they had once bobbed in her wake like fireflies while she'd run through the Beltane bonfires. So much flame, the heat smothering, the air itself singeing her lungs. 
You did this you did this you did this. The crack of dying trees groaned the words, cried them. The world was bathed in fire. Fire, not darkness. Motion between the trees snared her attention. The Lord of the North was frantic, mindless with agony, as he galloped toward her. As smoke streamed from his white coat, as fire devoured his mighty antlers not the immortal flame held between them on her own sigil, the immortal flame of the sacred stags of Turason, and of Mela Firebringer before that. But true, vicious flames. The Lord of the North thundered past. Burning, burning, burning. She reached a hand toward him, invisible and inconsequential, but the proud stag plunged on, screams rising from his mouth. Such horrible, relentless screams. As if the heart of the world were being shredded. She could do nothing when the stag threw himself into a wall of flame spread like a net between two burning oaks. He did not emerge. The white wolf was watching her again. Elan Oshriver Whitethorn Galathenius ran an ironclad finger over the rim of the stone altar on which she lay. As much movement as she could manage. Cairn had left her here this time. Had not bothered moving her to the iron box against the adjacent wall. A rare reprieve. To wake not in darkness, but in flickering firelight. The braziers were dying, beckoning in the damp cold that pressed to her skin. To whatever wasn't covered by the iron. She'd already tugged on the chains as quietly as she could. But they held firm. They'd added more iron. On her. Starting with the metal gauntlets. She did not remember when that was. Where that had been. There had only been the box then. The smothering iron coffin. She had tested it for weaknesses, over and over. Before they'd sent that sweet-smelling smoke to knock her unconscious. She didn't know how long she'd slept after that. When she'd awoken here, there had been no more smoke. She'd tested it again, then. As much as the irons would allow. Pushing with her feet, her elbows, her hands against the unforgiving metal. She didn't have enough room to turn over. To ease the pain of the chains digging into her. Chafing her. The lash wounds etched deep into her back. Had vanished. The ones that had cleaved her. Skin to the bone. Or had that been a dream, too? She had drifted into memory, into years of training in an assassin's keep. Into lessons where she'd been left in chains, in her own waist, until she figured out how to remove them. But she'd been bound with that training in mind. Nothing she tried in the cramped dark had worked. The metal of the glove scraped against the dark stone, barely audible over the hissing braziers, the roaring river beyond them. Wherever they were. Her, and the wolf. Fenris. No chains bound him. None were needed. Maeve had ordered him to stay, to stand down, and so he would. For long minutes, they stared at each other. Elan did not reflect on the pain that had sent her into unconsciousness. Even as the memory of cracking bones set her foot twitching. The chains jangled. But nothing flickered where agony should have been rampant. Not a whisper of discomfort in her feet. She shut out the image of how that male cairn had taken them apart. How she'd screamed until her voice had failed. It might have been a dream. One of the. Endless horde that hunted her in the blackness. A burning stag, fleeing through the trees. Hours on this altar, her feet shattered beneath ancient tools. A silver-haired prince whose very scent was that of home. They blurred and bled, until even this moment, staring at the white wolf lying against the wall across from the altar, might be a fragment of an illusion. Elan's finger scratched along the curved edge of the altar again. The wolf blinked at her thrice. In the early days, months, years of this, they had crafted a silent code between them. Using the few moments she'd been able to dredge up speech, whispering through the near-invisible holes in the iron coffin. One blink for yes. Two for no. Three for. Are you all right? Four for I am here, I am with you. Five for this is real, you are awake. 
Fenris again blinked three times. Are you all right? Elin swallowed against the thickness in her throat, her tongue peeling off the roof of her mouth. She blinked once. Yes. She counted his blinks. Six. He'd made that one up. Liar, or something like it? She refused to acknowledge that. Particular code. She blinked once again. Yes. Dark eyes scanned her. He'd seen everything. Every moment of it. If he were permitted to shift, he could tell her what was fabricated and what was real. If any of it had been real. No injuries ever remained when she awoke. No pain. Only the memory of it, of Karen's smiling face as he carved her up over and over. He must have left her on the altar because he meant to return soon. Elan shifted enough to tug on the chains, the mask's lock digging into the back of her head. The wind had not brushed her cheeks, or most of her skin, in, she did not know. What wasn't covered in iron was clad in a sleeveless white shift that fell to mid-thigh. Leaving her legs and arms bare for cairns. Ministrations. There were days, memories, of even that shift being gone, of knives scraping over her abdomen. But whenever she awoke, the shift remained intact. Untouched. Unstained. Fenris's ears perked, twitching. All the alert Elan needed. She hated the trembling that began to coil around her bones as strolling footsteps scuffed beyond the square room and the iron door into it. The only way in. No windows. The stone hall she sometimes glimpsed beyond was equally sealed. Only the sound of water entered this place. It surged louder as the iron door unlocked. And groaned open. She willed herself not to shake as the brown-haired male approached. Awake so soon? I must not have worked you hard enough. That voice. She hated that voice above all others. Crooning and cold. He wore a warrior's garb, but no warrior's weapons hung from the belt at his slim waist. Cairn noted where her eyes fell and patted the heavy hammer dangling from his hip. So eager for more. There was no flame to rally to her. Not an ember. He stalked to the small pile of logs by one brazier and fed a few to the dying fire. It swirled and crackled, leaping upon the wood with hungry fingers. Her magic didn't so much as flicker in answer. Everything she ate and drank through the small slot in the mask's mouth was laced with iron. She'd refused it at first. Had tasted the iron and spat it out. She'd gone to the brink of dying from lack. Of water when they forced it down her throat. Then they'd let her starve starve until she broke and devoured whatever they put in front of her, iron or no. She did not often think about that time. That weakness. How excited Cairn had grown to see her eating, and how much he raged when it still did not yield what he wanted. Cairn loaded the other brazier before snapping his fingers at Fenris. You may see to your needs in the hall and return here immediately. As if a ghost hoisted him up, the enormous wolf padded out. Maeve had considered even that, granting Cairn power to order when Fenris ate and drank, when he pissed. She knew Cairn deliberately forgot sometimes. The canine winds of pain had reached her, even in the box. Real. That had been real. The male before her, a trained warrior in everything but honor and spirit, surveyed her body. How shall we play tonight, Elin? She hated the sound of her name on his tongue. Her lip curled back from her teeth. Fast as an ASP, Cairn gripped her throat hard enough to bruise. Such rage, even now. She would never let go of it the rage. Even when she sank into that burning sea within her, even when she sank to the darkness and flame, the rage guided her. Cairn's fingers dug into her throat, and she couldn't stop the choking noise that gasped from her. This can all be over with a few little words, princess, he purred, dropping low enough that his breath brushed her mouth. A few little words, and you and I will part ways forever. She'd never say them. Never swear the blood oath to Maeve. Swear it, and hand over everything she knew, everything she was. Become slave eternal. 
and usher in the doom of the world. Kieran's grip on her neck loosened, and she inhaled deeply. But his fingers lingered at the right side of her throat. She knew precisely what spot, what scar, he brushed his fingers over. The twin small markings in the space between her neck and shoulder. Interesting, Cairn murmured. Elin jerked her head away, baring her teeth again. Cairn struck her. Not her face, clad in iron that would rip open his knuckles. But her unprotected stomach. The breath slammed from her, and iron. Clanked as she tried and failed to curl onto her side. On silent pause, Fenris loped back in and took up his place against the wall. Concern and fury flared in the wolf's dark eyes as she gasped for air, as her chained limbs still attempted to curl around her abdomen. But Fenris could only lower himself onto the floor once more. Four blinks. I am here, I am with you. Karen didn't see it. Didn't remark on her one blink in reply as he smirked at the tiny bites on her neck, sealed with the salt from the warm waters of Skulls Bay. Rowan's marking. A mate's marking. She didn't let herself think of him too long. Not as Cairn thumbed free that heavy-headed hammer and weighed it in his broad hands. If it wasn't for Maeve's gag order, the male mused, surveying her body like a painter. Assessing an empty canvas, I'd put my own teeth in you. See if Whitethorn's marking holds up then. Dread coiled in her gut. She'd seen the evidence of what their long hours here summoned from him. Her fingers curled, scraping the stone as if it were Cairn's face. Cairn shifted the hammer to one hand. This will have to do, I suppose. He ran his other hand down the length of her torso, and she jerked against the chains at the proprietary touch. He smiled. So responsive. He gripped her bare knee, squeezing gently. We started at the feet earlier. Let's go higher this time. Elin braced herself. Took plunging. Breaths that would bring her far away from here. From her body. She'd never let them break her. Never swear that blood oath. For Teresen, for her people, whom she had. Left to endure their own torment for ten long years. She owed them this much. Deep, deep, deep she went, as if she could outrun what was to come, as if she could hide from it. The hammer glinted in the firelight as it rose over her knee, Cairn's breath sucking in, anticipation and delight mingling on his face. Fenris blinked, over and over and over. I am here, I am with you. It didn't stop the hammer from falling. Or the scream that shattered from her throat. Hyperlink backslash L Chapter 4 This camp has been abandoned for months. Manon turned from the snow-crusted cliff where she'd been monitoring the western edge of the White Fang Mountains. Toward the wastes. Asterin remained crouched over the half-buried remnants of a fire pit, the shaggy goat pelt slung over her shoulders ruffling in the frigid wind. Her second went on, no one's been here since early autumn. Manon had suspected as much. The shadows had spotted the site an hour earlier on their patrol of the terrain ahead, somehow. Noticing the irregularities cleverly hidden in the leeward side of the rocky peak. The mother knew Manon herself might have flown right over it. Asterin stood, brushing snow from the knees of her leathers. Even the thick material wasn't enough to ward against the brutal cold. Hence the mountain goat pelts they'd resorted to wearing. Good for blending into the snow, Etta had claimed, the shadow even letting the dark hair dye she favored wash away these weeks to reveal the moon white of her natural shade. Manon's shade. Briar had kept the dye. One of them was needed to scout at night, the other shadow had claimed. Manon surveyed the two shadows carefully. Stalking through the camp. Perhaps no longer shadows, but rather the two faces of the moon. One dark, one light. One of many changes to the thirteen. Manon blew out a breath, the wind tearing away the hot puff. They're out there, Asterin murmured so the others might not hear from where they gathered by the overhanging boulder that shielded them from the wind. Three camps, Manon said with equal quiet. All long abandoned. We're hunting ghosts. 
Asterin's gold hair ripped free of its braid, blowing westward. Toward the homeland they might very well never see. The camps are proof their flesh and blood. Ghislaine thinks they might be from the late summer hunts. They could also be from the wild men of these mountains. Though Manon knew they weren't. She'd hunted enough croc hunts during the past hundred years to spot their style of making fires, their neat little camps. All the thirteen had. And they'd all tracked and killed so many of the wild men of the White Fangs earlier this year on Erewhon's behalf that they knew their habits, too. Asterin's gold-flecked black eyes fell on that blurred horizon. We'll find them. Soon. They had to find at least some of the Krokhan soon. Manon knew they had methods of communicating, scattered as they were. Ways to get out a call for help. A call for aid. Time was not on their side. It had been nearly two months since that day on the beach in Ilwi. Since she'd learned the terrible cost the Queen of Turason must pay to put an end to this madness. The cost that another with Mela's bloodline might also pay, if need be. Manon resisted the urge to glance over her. Shoulder to where the King of Adarlan stood amongst the rest of her thirteen, entertaining Vesta by summoning flame, water, and ice to his cupped palm. A small display of a terrible, wondrous magic. He set three whirls of the elements lazily dancing around each other, and Vesta arched an impressed brow. Manon had seen the way the red-haired sentinel looked at him, had noted that Vesta wisely refrained from acting on that desire. Manon had given her no such orders. Though. Hadn't said anything to the Thirteen about what, exactly, the human king was to her. Nothing, she wanted to say. Someone as unmoored as she. As quietly angry. And as pressed for time. Finding the third and final word key had proved futile. The two the king carried in his pocket offered no guidance, only their unearthly reek. Where Erewhon kept it? They had not the faintest inkling. To search Morith or any of his other outposts would be suicide. So they'd set aside their hunt, after weeks of fruitless searching, in favor of finding the Croc Hans. The king had protested initially, but yielded. His allies and friends in the north needed as many warriors as they could muster. Finding the Croc Hans. Manon wouldn't break her promise. She might be the disowned heir of the Blackbeak clan, might now command only a dozen witches, but she could still hold true to her word. So she'd find the Croc Hans. Convince them to fly into battle with the Thirteen. With her. Their last living Croak and Queen. Even if it led them all straight into the darkness's embrace. The sun arched higher, its light off the snows near blinding. Lingering was unwise. They'd survived these months with strength and wits. For while they'd hunted for the Croc Hans, they'd been hunted themselves. Yellow legs and blue bloods, mostly. All scouting patrols. Manon had given the order not to engage, not to kill. A missing Iron Teeth patrol would only pinpoint their location. Though Dorian could have snapped their necks without lifting a finger. It was a pity he hadn't been born a witch. But she'd gladly accept such a lethal ally. So would the Thirteen. What will you say, Asterin mused, when we find the Croc Hans? Manon had considered it over and over. If the Croc Hans would know who Lothian Blackbeak was, that she had loved Manon's father a rare-born Crokin prince. That her parents had dreamed, had believed they'd created a child to break the curse on the Iron Teeth and unite their peoples. A child not of war, but of peace. But those were foreign words on her tongue. Love. Peace. Manon ran a gloved finger over the scrap of red fabric binding the end of her braid. A shred from her half-sister's cloak. Rhiannon. Named for the last witch queen. Whose face Manon somehow bore. Manon said, I'll ask the Croc Hans not to shoot, I suppose. Asterin's mouth twitched toward a smile. I meant about who you are. She'd rarely balked from anything. Rarely feared anything. But saying the words, those words. I don't know, Manon admitted. We'll see if we get that far. 
the white demon. That's what the Krokhans called her. She was at the top of their to kill list. A witch every Kroken was to slay on sight. That fact alone said they didn't know what she was to them. Yet her half sister had figured it out. And then Manon had slit her throat. Manon Kin Slayer, her grandmother had taunted. The matron had likely relished every Kroken heart that Manon had brought to her at Black Beak Keep over the past hundred years. Manon closed her eyes, listening to the hollow song of the wind. Behind them, Abraxos let out an impatient, hungry whine. Yes, they were all hungry these days. We will follow you, Manon, Asterin said softly. Manon turned to her cousin. Do I deserve that honor? Asterin's mouth pressed into a tight line. The slight bump on her nose Manon had given her that. She'd broken it in the Omega's mess hall for brawling with mouthy yellow legs. Asterin had never once complained about it. Had seemed to wear the reminder of the beating Manon bestowed like a badge of pride. Only you can decide if you deserve it. Manon. Manon let the word settle as she shifted her gaze to the western horizon. Perhaps she'd deserve that honor if she succeeded in bringing them back to a home they'd never set eyes on. If they survived this war and all the terrible things they must do before it was over. It was no easy thing, to slip away from thirteen sleeping witches and their wyverns. But Dorian Havilliard had been studying. Them their watches, who slept deepest, who might report seeing him walk away from their small fire and who would keep their mouths shut. Weeks and weeks, since he'd settled on this idea. This plan. They'd camped on the small outcropping where they'd found long cold traces of the croc Hans, taking shelter under the overhanging rock, the wyverns a wall of leathery warmth around them. He had minutes to do this. He'd been practicing for weeks now making no bones of rising in the middle of the night, no more than a drowsy man displeased to have to brave the frigid elements to see to his needs. Letting the witches grow accustomed to his nightly movements. Letting Manon become accustomed to it. 2. Though nothing had been declared between them, their bedrolls still wound up beside each other every night. Not that a camp full of witches offered any sort of opportunity to tangle with her. No, for that, they'd resorted to winter bear forests and snow-blasted passes, their hands roving for any bit of bear skin they dared expose to the chill air. Their couplings were brief, savage, teeth, and nails and snarling. And not just from Manon. But after a day of fruitless searching, little more than a glorified guard against the enemies hunting them while his friends bled to save their lands, he needed the release as much as she did. They never discussed it what hounded them. Which was fine by him. Dorian had no idea what sort of man that made him. Most days, if he was being honest, he felt little. Had felt little for months, save for those. Stolen, wild moments with Manon. And save for the moments when he trained with the Thirteen, and a blunt sort of rage drove him to keep swinging his sword, keep getting back up when they knocked him down. Sword play, archery, knife work, tracking they taught him everything he asked. Along with the solid weight of Damaris, a witch knife now hung from his sword belt. It had been gifted to him by Sarl when he'd first managed to pin the stone-faced third. Two weeks ago. But when the lessons were done, when they sat around a small fire they dared to risk each night, he wondered if the witches could sniff out the restlessness that nipped at his heels. If they could now sniff out that he had no intention of taking a piss in the frigid night as he wended his way between their bedrolls. Then through the slight gap between Nereen, Asterin's sky-blue mare, and Abraxos. He nodded toward where Vesta stood on watch, and the red-haired witch, despite the brutal cold, threw a wicked smile his way before he rounded the corner of the rocky overhang and disappeared beyond view. He'd picked her watch for a reason. There were some amongst the thirteen who never smiled at all. Lynn who still seemed like she was debating carving him up to examine his insides, and Imogen, who kept to herself and didn't smile at anyone. Thea and Kaya usually reserved their smiles for each other, and when Feline and Fallon the green-eyed demon twins, 
as the others called them smiled, it meant hell was about to break loose. All of them might have been suspicious if he vanished for too long. But Vesta, who shamelessly flirted with him she'd let him linger outside the camp. Likely from fear of what Manon might do to her if she was spotted trailing after him into the dark. A bastard he was a bastard for using them like this. For assessing and monitoring them when they currently risked everything to find the Croc Hans. But it made no difference if he cared. About them. About himself, he supposed. Caring hadn't done him any favors. Hadn't done Sorsha any favors. And it wouldn't matter, once he gave up everything to seal the word gate. Damaris was a weight at his side but nothing compared to the two objects tucked into the pocket of his heavy jacket. Mercifully, he'd swiftly learned to drown out their whispering, their otherworldly beckoning. Most of the time. None of the witches had questioned why. He'd been so easily persuaded to give up the hunt for the third word key. He'd known better than to waste his time arguing. So he'd planned, and let them, let Manon, believe him to be content in his role to guard them with his magic. Reaching the boulder shrouded clearing. That he'd scouted earlier under the guise of aimlessly wandering the site, Dorian made quick work of his preparations. He had not forgotten a single movement of Elin's hands in Skull's Bay when she'd smeared her blood on the floor of her room at the Ocean Rose. But it was not Elena whom he planned to summon with his blood. When the snow was red with it, when he'd made sure the wind was still blowing its scent away from the witch camp, Dorian unsheathed Damaris and plunged it into the circle of word marks. And then waited. His magic was a steady thrum through him, the small flame he dared to conjure enough to heat his body. To keep him from shivering to death while the minutes passed. Ice had been the first manifestation of his magic. He supposed that should give him some sort of preference for it. Or at least some immunity. He had neither. And he'd decided that if they survived long enough to endure the scorching heat of summer, he'd never complain about it again. He'd been honing his magic as best he could during these weeks of relentless, useless hunting. None of the witches possessed power, not beyond the yielding, which they told him could only be summoned once to terrible and devastating effect. But the thirteen watched with some degree of interest. While Dorian kept up the lessons Rowan had started. Ice fire. Water. Healing. Wind. With the snows, attempting to coax life from the frozen earth had proved impossible, but he still tried. The only magic that always leapt at his summons remained that invisible force, capable of snapping bone. That, the witches liked best. Especially since it made him their greatest line of defense against their enemies. Death that was his gift. All he seemed able to offer those around him. He was little better than his father in that regard. The flame flowed over him, invisible and steadying. They hadn't heard a whisper of Elin. Or Rowan and their companions. Not one whisper of whether the queen was still Maeve's captive. She had been willing to yield everything to save Teresen, to save all of them. He could do nothing less. Elin certainly had more to lose. A mate and husband who loved her. A court who'd follow her into hell. A kingdom long awaiting her return. All he had was an unmarked grave for a healer no one would remember, a broken empire, and a shattered castle. Dorian closed his eyes for a moment, blocking out the sight of the glass castle exploding, the sight of his father reaching for him, begging for forgiveness. A monster the man had been a monster in every possible way. Had sired Dorian while possessed by a Valg demon. What did it make him? His blood ran red. And the Valg prince who'd infested Dorian himself had delighted on feasting on him, on making him enjoy all he'd done while collared. But did it still make him fully? Human. Blowing out a long breath, Dorian opened his eyes. A man stood across the snowy clearing. Dorian bowed low. Gavin. The first king of Adarlan had his eyes. Or rather Dorian had Gavin's eyes, passed down through the thousand years between them. The rest of the ancient king's face was foreign, the long, 
dark brown hair, the harsh features, the grave cast of his mouth. You learn the marks. Dorian rose from his bow. I'm a quick study. Gavin didn't smile. The summoning is not a gift to be used lightly. You risk much, young king, in calling me here. Considering what you carry. Dorian patted the jacket pocket where the two word keys lay, ignoring the strange, terrible power that pulsed against his hand in answer. Everything is a risk these days. He straightened. I need your help. Gavin didn't reply. His stare slid to Damaris, still plunged in the snow amid the marks. A personal effect of the king, as Elin had used the Eye of Elena to summon the ancient queen. At least you have taken good care of my sword. His eyes lifted to Dorian's, sharp as the blade itself. Though I cannot say the same of my kingdom. Dorian clenched his jaw. I inherited a bit. Of a mess from my father, I'm afraid. You were a prince of Adarlan long before you became its king. Dorian's magic churned to ice, colder than the night around him. Then consider me trying to atone for years of bad behavior. Gavin held his gaze for a moment that stretched into eternity. A true king, that's what the man before him was. A king not only in title, but in spirit. As few had been since Gavin was laid to rest beneath the foundations of the castle he'd built along the Avery. Dorian withstood the weight of Gavin's. Stare. Let the king see what remained of him, marked the pale band around his throat. Then Gavin blinked once the only sign of his permission to continue. Dorian swallowed. Where is the third key? Gavin stiffened. I am forbidden to say. Forbidden, or won't. He supposed he should be kneeling, should keep his tone respectful. How many legends about Gavin had he read as a child? How many times had he run through the castle, pretending to be the king before him? Dorian pulled the amulet of Arinth from his jacket, letting it sway in the bitter wind. A silent, ghostly song leaked from the gold and blue medallion speaking in languages that did not exist. Bran and Galathenius defied the gods by putting the key in here with a warning to Elin. The least you could do is give me a direction. Gavin's edges blurred, but held. Not much. Time. For either of them. Brannon Galathenius was an arrogant bastard. I have seen what interfering with the gods' plans brings about. It will not end well. Your wife, not the gods, brought this about. Gavin bared his teeth. And though the man was long dead, Dorian's magic flared again, readying to strike. My mate, Gavin snarled, is the cost of this. My mate, should the keys be retrieved will vanish forever. Do you know what that is like, young king? To have eternity and then have it ripped away. Dorian didn't bother to reply. You don't wish me to find the third key because it will mean the end of Elena. Gavin said nothing. Dorian let out a growl. Countless people will die if the keys aren't put back in the gate. He shoved the amulet of Arinth back into his jacket, and once again ignored the otherworldly hum pulsing against his bones. You can't be that selfish. Gavin remained silent, the wind shifting. His dark hair. But his eyes flickered just barely. Tell me where, Dorian breathed. He had mere minutes until even Vesta came looking for him. Tell me where the third key is. Your life will be forfeit, too. If you... Retrieve the keys and forge the lock. Your soul will be claimed as well. Not one scrap of you will live on in the afterworld. There's no one who would really care about that anyway. He certainly didn't. And he'd certainly deserved that sort of end, when he'd failed so many times. With all he'd done. Gavin studied him for a long moment. Dorian held still beneath that fierce stare. A warrior who had survived the second of Erewhon's wars. Elena helped Elin, Dorian pressed, his breath curling in the space between them. She didn't balk from it, even knowing what it meant for her fate. And neither did Elin, who will have neither a long life with her own mate, nor eternity with him. As I will not have, either. 
his heart began thundering, his magic rising with it. And yet you would. You would run from it. Gavin's teeth flashed. Erewhon could be defeated without sealing the gate. Tell me how, and I will find a way to do it. Yet Gavin fell silent again, his hands clenching at his sides. Dorian snorted softly. If you knew, it would have been done long ago. Gavin shook his head, but Dorian plunged ahead. Your friends died battling Erewhon's hordes. Help me avoid the same fate for my own. It might already be too late for some of them. His stomach churned. Had Kaol made it to the southern continent? Perhaps it would be better if his friend never returned, if he stayed safe in Antica. Even if Kaol would never do such a thing. Dorian glanced toward the rocky corner he'd rounded. Not much time left. And what of a darlin? Gavin demanded. You would leave it kingless. The question said enough of Gavin's opinion regarding Holland. This is how you would atone for years spent idling as its crown prince. Dorian took the verbal blow. It was nothing but truth, dealt by a man who had served its nameless god. Does it really matter anymore? A darlin was my pride. It is no longer worthy of it, Dorian snapped. It hasn't been for a long, long time. Perhaps it deserves to fall into ruin. Gavin angled his head. The words of a reckless, arrogant boy. Do you think you are the only one who has endured loss? And yet your own fear of loss makes you choose one woman over the fate of the world. If you had the choice your woman or Irelia would you have chosen any? Differently. Sorshot or the world? The question rang hollow. Some of the fire within him banked. Yet Dorian dared to say, you delude yourself about the path ahead, yet you serve the god of truth. Kaol had told him of their discovery in the catacombs beneath Riftold's sewers this spring. The forgotten bone temple where Gavin's deathbed confession had been written. What does he have to say about Elena's role in this? The all-seeing one does not claim. Kinship with those spineless creatures, Gavin growled. Dorian could have sworn a dusty, bone-dry wind rattled through the pass. Then what is he? Can there not be many gods, from many places? Some born of this world, some born elsewhere? That's a question to debate at another time, Dorian ground out. When we're not at war. He took a long breath. Another one. Please, he breathed. Please help me save my friends. Help me make it right. It was all he really had left this task. Gavin again watched him, weighed him. Dorian withstood it. Let him read whatever truth was written on his soul. Pain clouded the king's face. Pain, and regret, as Gavin finally said, the key is at Morath. Dorian's mouth went dry. Where in Morath? I don't know. Dorian believed him. The raw dread in Gavin's eyes confirmed it. The ancient king nodded to Damaris. That sword is not ornamental. Let it guide you, if you cannot trust yourself. It really tells the truth. It was blessed by the all-seeing one himself, after I swore myself to him. Gavin shrugged, a half-tame gesture. As if the man had never really left the wilds of Adarlan where he'd risen from war leader to high king. You'll still have to learn for yourself what is truth and what is lie. But Damaris will help me find the key at Morath. To break into Erewhon's stronghold, where all those collars were made. Gavin's mouth tightened. I cannot say. But I will tell you this, do not venture toward Morath just yet. Until you are ready. I'm ready now. A fool's lie. Gavin knew it, too. It was an effort not to touch his neck, the pale band forever marring his skin. Morath is no mere keep, Gavin said. It is a hell, and it is not kind to reckless young men. Dorian stiffened, but Gavin went on, you will know when you are truly ready. Remain at this camp, if you can convince your companions. The path will find you here. Gavin's edges warped further, his face turning murky. Dorian dared a step forward. 
Am I human? Gavin Sapphire eyes softened just barely. I'm not the person who can answer that. And then the king was gone. Hyperlink backslash L chapter 5. The commander in the alley had claimed his latest orders had been dispatched from Doranel. None of them knew whether to believe him. Sitting around a tiny fire in a dusty field on the outskirts of a ramshackle city, the blood long since washed from his hands, Lork and Salvatera again mulled over the logic of it. Had they somehow overlooked the simplest option? For Maeve to have been in Doranel this entire time, hidden from her subjects? But that commander had been lying filth. He'd spat in Lorcan's face before they'd ended it. The other commander they'd found today, however, after a week of hunting him down at the nearest seaport, had claimed he'd received orders from a distant kingdom they'd searched three weeks ago. In the opposite direction of Doranel. Lorcan towed at the dirt. None of them had felt like speaking since the commander this afternoon had contradicted the first's claim. Doranel is Maeve's stronghold, Elide said at last, her steady voice filling the heavy quiet. Simple as it is, it would make sense for her to bring Elan there. Whitethorn only stared into the fire. He hadn't washed the blood from his dark grey jacket. It would be impossible, even for Maeve. To keep her hidden in Doranel, Lork encountered. We would have heard about it by now. He wasn't sure when he'd last spoken to the woman before him. She hadn't balked from how he'd broken Maeve's commanders, though. She'd cringed during the worst of it, yes, but she'd listened to every word Rowan and Lorcan had wrung from them. Lorcan supposed she'd seen worse at Morith hated that she had. Hated that her monster of an uncle still breathed. But that hunt would come later. After they found Elin. Or whatever remained of her. Elide's eyes grew cold, so cold, as she said, Maeve managed to conceal Gavriel and Fenris from Rowan in Skulls Bay. And somehow hid and spirited away her entire fleet. Lorcan didn't reply. Elide went on, her gaze unwavering, Maeve knows Doranel would be the obvious choice the choice we'd likely reject because it's too simple. She anticipated that we'd believe she'd haul Elin to the farthest reaches of Irelia, rather than right back home. Maeve would have the advantage of an easily summoned army, Gavriel added, his tattooed throat bobbing. Which would make rescue difficult. Lorcan refrained from telling Gavriel to shut his mouth. He hadn't failed to notice how often Gavriel went out of his way to help Elide, to talk to her. And yes, some small part of him was grateful for it, since the gods knew she wouldn't accept any sort of help from him. Hellas damn him, he'd had to resort to giving his cut-up shirt to Whitethorn and Gavriel to hand to her for her cycle. He'd threatened to skin them alive if they'd said it. Was his, and Elide, with her human sense of smell, hadn't scented him on the fabric. He didn't know why he bothered. He hadn't forgotten her words that day on the beach. I hope you spend the rest of your miserable, immortal life suffering. I hope you spend it alone. I hope you live with regret and guilt in your heart and never find a way to endure it. Her vow, her curse, whatever it had been, had held true. Every word of it. He'd broken something. Something precious beyond measure. He'd never cared until now. Even the severed blood oath, still gaping wide within his soul, didn't come close to the hole in his chest when he looked at her. She'd offered him a home in Peranth knowing he'd be a dishonored male. Offered him a home with her. But it hadn't been Maeve's sundering of the oath that had rescinded that offer. It had been a betrayal so great he didn't know how to fix it. Where is Elin? Where is my wife? Whitethorn's wife and his mate. Only this mission of theirs, this endless quest to find her, kept Lorcan from plunging into a pit from which he knew he would not emerge. Perhaps if they found her, if there was still enough left of Elin to salvage after Cairn's ministrations, he'd find a way to live with himself. To endure this, person he'd become. It might take him another five hundred years to do so. He didn't let himself consider that Elide would be little more than dust by then. The thought alone was enough to turn the paltry dinner of stale bread and hard cheese in his stomach. 
a fool he was an immortal, stupid fool for starting down this path with her, for forgetting that even if she forgave him, her mortality beckoned. Lorcan said at last, it would also make sense for Maeve to go to the Akadians, as the commander today claimed. Maeve has long maintained ties with that kingdom. He, Whitethorn, and Gavriel had been to war and back in that sand-blasted territory. He'd never wished to set foot in it again. Their armies would shield her. For it would take an army to keep Whitethorn from reaching his mate. He turned toward the prince, who gave no indication he'd been listening. Lorcan didn't want to consider if Whitethorn would soon need to add a tattoo to the other side of his face. The commander today was much more forthcoming, Lorcan went on to the prince he'd fought beside for so many centuries, who had been as cold-hearted a bastard as Lorcan himself until this spring. You barely threatened him and he sang for us. The one who claimed Maeve was in Doranel was still sneering by the end. I think she's in Doranel, Elide cut in. Anith told me to listen that day. She didn't the other two times. It's something to consider, yes, Lorcan said, and Elide's eyes sparked with irritation. I see no reason to believe the gods would be that clear. Says the male who feels the touch of a god, telling him when to run or fight, Elide snapped. Lorcan ignored her, that truth. He hadn't felt Hellas's touch since the stone marshes. As if even the god of death was repulsed by him. Acadia's border is a three-day ride from here. Its capital three days beyond that. Doranel is over two weeks away, if we travel with little rest. And time was not on their side. With the word keys, with Erewhon, with the war surely unleashing itself back on Elide's own continent, every delay came at a cost. Not to mention what each day undoubtedly brought upon the Queen of Teresan. Elide opened her mouth, but Lorcan cut her off. And then, to arrive in Maeve's stronghold exhausted and hungry. We won't stand a chance. Not to mention that with the veiling she can wield, we might very well walk right past Elin and never know it. Elide's nostrils flared, but she turned to Rowan. The call is yours, Prince. Not just a prince, not any more. Consort to the Queen of Teresan. At last, Whitethorn lifted his head. As those green eyes settled on him, Lorcan withstood the weight in his gaze, the innate dominance. He'd been waiting for Rowan to claim the vengeance he deserved, waiting for that blow. Hoping for it? It had never come. We've come this far south, Rowan said. At last, his voice low. Better to go to Acadia than risk venturing all the way to Doranel to find we were wrong. And that was that. Elide only threw a seething glare toward Lorcan and Rose, murmuring about seeing to her needs before she went to sleep. Her gait held steady as she crunched through the grass. Thanks to the brace Gavriel kept around her ankle. It should have been his magic helping her. Touching her skin. Her steps turned distant, near silent. She usually went farther than necessary to avoid having them hear anything. Lorcan gave her a few minutes before he stalked into the dark after her. He found Elide already heading back, and she paused atop a little hill, barely more than a hump of dirt in the field. What do you want? Lorcan kept walking, until he was at the base of the hill, and stopped. Acadia is the wiser choice. Rowan decided that, too. You must be so pleased. She made to stomp past him, but Lorcan stepped into her path. She craned back her neck to see his face, yet he'd never felt smaller. Shorter. I didn't push for Acadia to spite you, he managed to say. I don't care. She tried to edge around him, Lorcan easily. Keeping ahead of her. I didn't, the word strangled him. I didn't mean for this to happen. Elide let out a soft, vicious laugh. Of course you didn't. Why would you have intended for your wondrous queen to sever the blood oath? I don't care about that. He didn't. He'd never spoken truer words. I only wished to make things right. Her lip curled. 
I would be inclined to believe that if I hadn't seen you crawling after Maeve on the beach. Lorcan blinked at the words, the hatred in them, stunned enough that he let her walk past this time. Elide didn't so much as look back. Not until Lorcan said, I didn't crawl after Maeve. She halted, hair swaying. Slowly, she glanced over her shoulder. Imperious and cold. As the stars overhead. I crawled, his throat bobbed. I crawled after Ilan. He shut out the bloody sand, the queen's screams, her final, pleading requests to Elide. Shut them out and said, when Maeve severed the oath, I couldn't move, could barely breathe. Such agony that Lorcan couldn't imagine what it would be like to sever the oath on his own, without bidding. It was not the sort of pain one walked away from. The oath could be stretched, drawn thin. That Vaughn, the last of their cotter, still undoubtedly roamed the wilds of the north in his hunt for Lorcan was proof enough that the blood oath's restraints might be worked around. But to break it outright of his own will, to find some way to snap the tether, would be to embrace death. He'd wondered during these months if he should have done just that. Lorcan swallowed. I tried to get to her. To Elin. I tried to get to that box. He added so quietly only Elide could hear it, I promise. His word was his bond, the only currency he cared to trade in. He'd told her that once, during those weeks on the road. Nothing flickered in her eyes to tell him she remembered. Elide merely strode back for the camp. Lorcan remained where he was. He had done this. Brought this upon her, upon them. Elide reached the campfire, and Lorcan followed at last, nearing its ring of light in time to see her plop down beside Gavriel, her mouth tight. The lion murmured to her, he wasn't lying, you know. Lorcan clenched his jaw, making no attempt to disguise his footsteps. If Gavriel's ears were sharp enough to have heard every word of their conversation, the lion certainly knew he was approaching. And certainly knew better than to shove his nose in their business. Yet Lorcan still found himself scanning. Elide's face, waiting for her answer. And when she ignored both the lion and Lorcan, he found himself wishing he hadn't spoken at all. Prince Rowan Whitethorn Galathenius, consort, husband, and mate of the Queen of Teresin, knew he was dreaming. He knew it, because he could see her. There was only darkness here. And wind. And a great, yawning chasm between them. No bottom existed in that abyss, that crack in the world. But he could hear whispers. Snaking through it, down far below. She stood with her back to him, hair blowing in a sheet of gold. Longer than he'd seen it the last time. He tried to shift, to fly over the chasm. His body's innate magic ignored him. Locked in his fey body, the jump too far, he could only stare toward her, breathe in her scent jasmine, lemon verbena, and crackling embers. As it floated to him on the wind. This wind told him no secrets, had no song to sing. It was a wind of death, of cold, of nothing. Elin. He had no voice here, but he spoke her name. Threw it across the gulf between them. Slowly, she turned to him. It was her face or it would be in a few years. When she settled. But it wasn't the slightly older features that knocked the breath from him. It was the hand on her rounded belly. She stared toward him, hair still flowing. Behind her, four small figures emerged. Rowan fell to his knees. The tallest, a girl with golden hair and pine green eyes, solemn faced and as proud as her mother. The boy beside her, nearly her height, smiled at him, warm and bright, his Oshriver eyes near glowing beneath his cap of silver hair. The boy next to him, silver haired and green eyed, might as well have been Rowan's twin. And the smallest girl, clinging to her mother's legs. A fine boned, silver haired child, little more than a babe, her blue eyes harking back to a lineage he did not know. Children. His children. Their children. With another mere weeks from being born. His family. The family he might have, 
the future he might have. The most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. Elin. Their children pressed closer to her, the eldest girl peering up to Elin in warning. Rowan felt it then. A lethal, mighty black wind sweeping for them. He tried to scream. Tried to get off his knees, to find some way to them. But the black wind roared in, ripping and tearing everything in its path. They were still staring at him as it swept them away, too. Until only dust and shadow remained. Rowan jerked awake, his heart a frantic beat as his body bellowed to move, to fight. But there was nothing and no one to fight here, in this dusty field beneath the stars. A dream. That same dream. He rubbed at his face, sitting up on his bedroll. The horses dozed, no sign of distress. Gavriel kept watch in mountain lion form just beyond the light of the fire, his eyes gleaming in the dark. Elide and Lorcan didn't stir from their heavy slumber. Rowan scanned the position of the stars. Only a few hours until dawn. And then to Acadia to that land of scrub and sand. While Elide and Lorcan had debated where to go, he'd waited himself. Whether to fly to Doranel alone and risk losing precious days in what might be a fool's search. Had Vaughn been with them, had Vaughn been freed, he might have dispatched the warrior in his osprey form to Doranel while they continued on to Acadia. Rowan again considered it. If he pushed his magic, harnessed the winds to him, the two weeks it would take to reach Doranel could be done in days. But if he somehow did find Elin, he'd waged enough battles to know he'd need Lorcan and Gavriel's strength before things were over. That he might jeopardize Elin in trying to free her without their help. Which would mean flying back to them, then making the agonizingly slow trip northward. And with Acadia so close, the wiser choice was to search there first. In case the commander today had spoken true. And if what they learned in Acadia led them to Doranel, then to Doranel they would go. Together. Even if it went against every instinct as her mate. Her husband. Even if every day, every hour, that Elin spent in Maeve's clutches was likely bringing her more suffering than he could stand to consider. So they'd travel to Acadia. Within a few days, they'd enter the flat plains, and then the distant dried hills beyond. Once the winter rains began, the plain would be green, lush but after the scorching summer, the lands were still brown and wheat-colored, water scarce. He'd ensure they stocked up at the next river. Enough for the horses, too. Food might be in short supply, but there was game to be found on the plains. Scrawny rabbits and small, furred things that burrowed in the cracked earth. Precisely the sort of food Elin would cringe to eat. Gavriel noticed the movement at their camp and patted over, massive paws silent even on the bone-dry grass. Tawny, inquisitive eyes blinked at him. Rowan shook his head at the unspoken question. Get some sleep. I'll take over. Gavriel angled his head in a gesture Rowan knew meant, are you all right? Strange it was still strange to work with the lion, with Lorcan, without the bonds of Maeve's oath binding them to do so. To know that they were here by choice. What it now made them, Rowan wasn't entirely certain. Rowan ignored Gavriel's silent inquiry and stared into the dwindling fire. Get some rest while you can. Gavriel didn't object as he prowled to his bedroll, and plopped onto it with a feline sigh. Rowan suppressed the twinge of guilt. He'd been pushing them hard. They hadn't complained, hadn't asked him to slow the grueling pace he'd set. He'd felt nothing in the bond since that day on the beach. Nothing. She wasn't dead, because the bond still existed, yet, it was silent. He'd puzzled over it during the long hours they'd traveled, during his hours on watch. Even the hours when he should have been sleeping. He hadn't felt pain in the bond that day in Ilwi. He'd felt it when Dorian Havilliard had stabbed her in the glass castle, had felt the bond what he'd so stupidly thought was the Karanam bond between them stretching to the breaking point as she'd come so, so close to death. Yet that day on the beach, when Maeve had attacked her, 
then had Cairn whip her. Rowan clenched his jaw hard enough to hurt, even as his stomach roiled. He glanced to Goldrin, lying beside him on the bedroll. Gently, he set the blade before him, staring into the ruby in the center of its hilt, the stone smoldering in the firelight. Elin had felt the arrow he'd received during the fight with Manon at Temiz's temple. Or enough of a jolt that she'd known, in that moment, that they were mates. Yet he hadn't felt anything at all that day on the beach. He had a feeling he knew the answer. Knew that Maeve was likely the cause of it, the damper on what was between them. She'd gone into his head to trick him into thinking Lyria was his mate, had fooled the very instincts that made him a female. It wouldn't be beyond her powers to find a way to stifle what was between him and Elin, to keep him from knowing that she'd been in such danger, and now to keep him from finding her. But he should have known. About Elin. Shouldn't have waited to get the wyverns and the others. Should have flown right to the beach, and not wasted those precious minutes. Mate. His mate. He should have known about that, too. Even if rage and grief had turned him into a miserable bastard, he should have known who she was, what she was, from the moment he'd bitten her at Mistward, unable to stop the urge to claim her. The moment her blood had landed on his tongue and it had sung to him, and then refused to leave him alone, its taste lingering for months. Instead, they'd brawled. He'd let them. Brawl, so lost in his anger and ice. She'd been just as raging as he, and had spat such a hateful, unspeakable thing that he'd treated her like any of the males and females who had been under his command and mouthed off, but those early days still haunted him. Though Rowan knew that if he ever mentioned the brawling they'd done with a lick of shame, Elin would curse him for a fool. He didn't know what to do about the tattoo down his face, his neck, and arm. The lie it told of his loss, and the truth it revealed of his blindness. He'd come to love Lyria that had been true. And the guilt of it ate him alive whenever he thought of it, but he could understand now. Why Lyria had been so frightened of him for those initial months, why it had been so damn hard to court her, even with that mating bond, its truth unknown to Lyria as well. She had been gentle, and quiet, and kind. A different sort of strength, yes, but not what he might have chosen for himself. He hated himself for thinking it. Even as the rage consumed him at the thought, at what had been stolen from him. From Lyria, too. Elin had been his, and he had been hers, from the start. Longer than that. And Maeve had thought to break them, break her to get what she wanted. He wouldn't let that go unpunished. Just as he could not forget that Lyria, regardless of what truly existed between them, had been carrying their child when Maeve had sent those enemy forces to his mountain home. He would never forgive that. I will kill you, Elin had said when she'd heard what Maeve had done. How badly Maeve had manipulated him, shattered him, and destroyed Lyria. Elide had told him every word of the encounter, over and over. I will kill you. Rowan stared into the burning heart of Goldrin's ruby. He prayed that fire, that rage, had not broken. He knew how many days it had been, knew who Maeve had promised would oversee. The torture. Knew the odds were stacked against her. He'd spent two weeks strapped on an enemy's table. Still bore the scar on his arm from one of their more creative devices. Hurry. They had to hurry. Rowan leaned forward, resting his brow against Goldrin's hilt. The metal was warm, as if it still held a whisper of its bearer's flame. He had not set foot in Acadia since that last, horrible war. Though he'd led fey and mortal soldiers alike to victory, he'd never had any desire to see it again. But to Acadia they would go. And if he found her, if he freed her. Rowan did not let himself think beyond that. To the other truth that they would face, the other burden. Tell Rowan that I'm sorry I lied but tell him it was all borrowed time anyway. Even before today, I knew it was all just borrowed time, but I still wish we'd had more of it. He refused to accept that. 
would never accept that she would be the ultimate cost to end this, to save their world. Rowan scanned the blanket of stars overhead. While all other constellations had wheeled past, the Lord of the North remained, the immortal star between his antlers pointing the way home. To Teresen. Tell him he has to fight. He must save Teresen, and remember the vows he made to me. Time was not on their side, not with Maeve, not with the war unleashing itself back on their own continent. But he had no intention of returning without her, parting request or no, regardless of the oaths he'd sworn upon marrying her to guard and rule. Teresen. And tell him thank you for walking that dark path with me back to the light. It had been his honor. From the very beginning, it had been his honor, the greatest of his immortal life. An immortal life they would share together. Somehow. He'd allow no other alternative. Rowan silently swore it to the stars. He could have sworn the Lord of the North flickered in response.